Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast and our most ambitious week yet continues. Seven podcasts in seven days. What was I thinking about? Hey, look, this is a celebration of the Style Council and a brand new episode, each one with a different honorary councillor. Today it's the turn of bass player Anthony Harty. Get ready for the global adventures of the Style Council. One of the original members of the live band, you're going to love his stories on life with Paul Weller and beyond. So let's get into it. Hi, Anthony. Hello. Thanks for having me. Your experience with Paul and with the Style Council kicked off at a very young age. But before we get to that, when did you first discover the music of Paul Weller? Gosh, um, I guess sort of 12 something like that. You know, there was the local mod group of people. We were all all into the same sort of stuff and we hung out together and all into the jam and probably about 79. What was it that connected with you? I think it was the the power of the sound that hooked up with The Who and the small faces. And and, and it was like the good side of the punk, that what, what came out of the punk scene, really. That really turned me on to it. I mean, I'm still a huge fan of that genre. The power pop thing, as it as is known, there's a couple of great bands that are still kicking about, that are still churning out new stuff in that genre. So, and I still sort of hark back to '79 when it when I got into everything, as well as the jam and uh, everything. The the whole new wave thing really really sort of changed my attitude to music. I'm guessing at that point you're getting into playing music as well, are you? Uh, I started playing guitar when I was eight. Oh, wow. I started playing, yeah. Oh, wow. um, my fingers were too small, so they used to click. But my brother just used to give me a really hard time because he wanted to be flash lead guitar and he needed someone to back him up sort of thing. So I just put up with it, learned the basic chords and I started playing guitar when I was eight and started playing bass when I was 14. There was a couple of guys formed a, a three-piece band with called Wipeout. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately, I immediately think of the surf song. <laughs> Wipeout. Exactly. That's, yeah. yeah, we did that. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Let's then fast forward to the Style Council because Paul splits the jam, tail end of, of 82, the straight out of school, you're in... 16 years old, April 1983, I guess, wasn't it? You send him a tape, was that right? Yeah, I did. One of the mod squad that I hung around with, sort of walking along, doing nothing, as we usually did. And uh, I said, just at the time I was about to leave school, I said to this guy I wanted to be a professional musician, but I didn't know how. And he sort of said half-jokingly, why don't you write to Paul? And I took him on his word and um, Speak Like a Child had just come out. And I got a copy of Speak Like a Child and I had this um, music centre with a cassette player and a, a record player and I could plug my bass into it. So I learnt the bass line, played along, stuck that onto a cassette and sent it off with a letter and uh, I got a reply back in a couple of weeks. So <laughs> just bonkers, really. <laughs> what, what did the reply say? He just said, thanks for thanks for getting in touch and they were looking for a bass player and um, just got, asked me a few things about what other music I was into. I asked my mate what music well I was into. <laughs> 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 uh, at the time he was, into, he was listening to Blue Note and stuff like that so I was right on the cusp I was there I was there <laughs> John Coltrane Miles Davis yeah. <laughs> who are these people who are they that's brilliant <laughs> Until, still to this day you've no idea <laughs> <laughs> bought Blue Train I do like Blue Train that's so funny <laughs> wow amazing and yeah. so for two years you're with the Style Council as an honorary councillor so how did it come from that letter to then being essentially part of that initial really kind of free-flowing format and, and lineup. Well, I went down to, to London. My mum wouldn't let me go down on my own. Yeah, I went down to two auditions or three auditions. I can't remember when. Dave Little, the old um, stage manager, he told me afterwards that uh, there was another guy who thought of exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. They saw more, more potential in me, so they gave me the gig. They stuck me in, um, in a B&B opposite the studio in Stanhope Place. And um, then we started rehearsing in, I think it was September, 83, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So you're there. So this is Solid Bond Studio Marble Archway. Yeah. So this is, um, essentially Style Council HQ, which we've talked about a couple of times on, on the show and how important that was to <laughs> creation of these records and the place where they can just kind of experiment and test new sounds and try new things out and stuff. It sounds like, I mean, it sounds like such an incredible environment to work in a really creative environment. Yeah. I bet you can't believe your luck as a kid, can you? I mean, this is mad. Well, it was a bit surreal because um, I still had jam posters on my wall, but <laughs> there was sort of a separation between the Paul that 
I work with and the Paul that was on my wall. It was like two different people because you don't, you never assume that you'll, especially when you're a kid, you never, you're, you never assume that you'll, you'll work with these guys or you'll know them or, or anything like that. So I guess there's that sort of altered thing that you, that your mind does where he's one person and he's another, you know, he, he was just so sort of on it and he knew exactly what he wanted to do. And yeah, he was, he was totally in control and, you know, well beyond his years really in as far as that was concerned, knocking out songs left, right and centre. And can you remember first live performance then? So can you remember that first time when you're on the road and you're in front of a crowd? Vaguely. The first tour was a bit of a blur. I remember getting upset because I'd been up, been away from home for, you know, a week or two and uh, you start getting homesick. I mean, it was like being on a school trip, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I was exactly uh, like that when I went away with the Cub Scouts. (laughs) Yeah. Because of the family environment within the band, you know, you had Auntie Hillary, who, not not Hillary, sax player, but one of the girls that used to work in the office, used to come out on the road, do your ironing and... Uncle Dave that used to look after you and stuff. And so it was a good environment to be in. And Paul called the, the tour bus. It was like a youth club, you know, <laughs> so it was a good place to be. So March 1984, it's the first BBC TV Radio 1 performance for the Style Council. This big thing at Gold Diggers in Chippenham, pre-Cafe Blur. Was it live at the time? So you were playing and it was then going on TV and radio at the same time. Was that right? Yeah. How did that feel? How nervous were you about being on TV and radio for the first time? It didn't really It didn't really hit you, you know, the fact that it was being broadcast. I, I, I remember the first tube I did, to digress again, where... You think that you're playing to those people in the room, so a few hundred people in the room at the tube. And then some bright spark told me that we were playing to three three million or whatever it was. So that's why I looked like the rabbit in the headlights. But by that time, I got quite comfortable on stage. You're looking around, everybody's having a good time, so you are, and you tend to forget what the occasion is, and we just got on with it, really. I think it was halfway through rehearsals that we did the gig, and I remember a few few choice mistakes and you can still hear them now (laughs) quite painful yeah (laughs) it's quite remarkable looking back i think it was sort of after we'd done the first tour we did the first tube and then we did the second tube the first one was a rabbit in the headlights and the other one cocky bloke chewing chewing gum on stage to looking like you know he'd had been on stage for 20 years you know so it was in at the deep end in the in the sort of the biggest sense of the word and sort of reveled in it it was the environment i wanted to be in so you just jump in with both feet really push yourself which i need i really needed to do another little thing that i did when i did the um tape that i sent to him i didn't really know like the finger style and i didn't really know the slap style because i'd never seen anybody sort of played that much. I actually played Speak Like a Child with a pick and just pulled the string for the for the slap bit. And then I when it started to get serious, I just realized, oh God, I've got to learn how to do it properly. <laughs> and it was it was as if I did it in like that, you know, and the slap thing just came. And I was playing it wrong first. And then I saw people like Mark King doing all this and we did this thing with Lenny Henry and um I was doing all this nonsense and he, he was taking the mickey out of me and, and stuff. <laughs> it just happened so fast. But to use another cliche, I just picked up the ball and ran and trying to keep up with everybody else as far as that was concerned. I find it remarkable that this band is full of inexperience, really, in terms of, you know, t- certainly in terms of live performance. You might practice a bit, you know, in your bedroom and all that. Um, yeah. Because Whitey's the same, like 17 years old and a couple of auditions with John Weller. I guess he must have had confidence in you, right? I think he did. I think what he what he basically said at the beginning was he didn't want session guys coming in that just looked like, you know, it was another day at the office sort of thing. He wanted enthusiasm and he wanted people around him who wanted to do it and wanted to prove themselves. So he wanted to get people with a point to prove, you know, around him. So, yeah, that was sort of how it went. And I guess, luckily, we just gelled. And I remember meeting... Um, Spandau Ballet in Paris and they were telling us how wonderful we were and how crap they were and we were just looking at them like are you serious <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't quite couldn't quite take that yeah, yeah. <laughs> brilliant so your, your mum sends your brother with you to the audition to make sure you're looked after how quickly were you away in terms of then going on European tours and over and going overseas yeah that was sort of um summer 
83 and then I was down in in London rehearsing in September and then off in October it was pretty quick the folks were a bit apprehensive and they sort of knew the the opportunity was too good in the back of their minds I had my what I call my Billy Elliot moment we did two nights at the Albert Hall and my brother took my dad down and my brother said my dad was crying all the way through and it really paid off. That's amazing though, isn't it? I mean, to think at that age, playing the Royal Albert Hall, wow, what, what an incredible, iconic venue. Hillary talks about this first European tour. and One time really sticks out in my mind when we were in Brussels in Belgium and I hadn't really drank before then. And I remember probably one of the first hotels we were in, John was going, right, I'm getting them in, I'm getting them in, who wants what? People shouting up drinks and... Um, I remember Mick Talbot going, I'll have a vodka and pineapple. And I went, oh, I'll have one of them. You know, <laughs> that didn't know what, what it was. So, yeah. And then I remember after a gig being in a, this really expensive restaurant with Mick and Jill and a few others, and we had these volcanoes. And basically, they looked like, I don't know, some mad scientist's drink, like these massive brandy glasses with this fiery liquid at the bottom. And then another little little glass inside with with some dry ice just coming out of it and that you know those stupid things you yeah. you remember didn't you spend your 17th birthday flying to japan with the band as well yes that was the because of the time difference it was the second half of the flight at the time you'd have you had to go via anchorage because of the no fly zone with russia and what have you so when we got back on the plane the crew got into their kimonos and everything and came Came with a, a little birthday cake and, and a birthday card, and everybody sang in a in really bad Japanese English. Happy birthday! <laughs> <laughs> they were huge in Japan, weren't they? Yeah, frightening. I mean, it was it was literally like being in the Beatles when we got off the plane. It was insane, and people, the girls, sort of camped out in the hotels, and they were in the corridors and stuff, and they'd follow you down in the lift. I always remember being in the lift with Paul first thing in the morning, and he'd used one of those crappy um, hotel razors, and he was got cut to ribbons, <laughs> and we had all these girls in there. <laughs> I feel like a right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Take it, taking Brilliant. photos, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, photo, photo. If you didn't do photo autographs they walk off and cry so you'd feel really guilty it was horrible the one big incident that sticks in my mind from japan is we were doing it was more like a little festival it was with big country in excess tracy was doing it bank all the motels but me and the british agent we went to see big country at one of the theaters awesome gig but we were the only Western people there. And we shared a, a program and everybody was walking out of the venue after the gig into the foyer. Somebody opened the program and looked at the picture and looked at me. And then there was chaos. And <laughs> literally, it was about 2,000 people coming up to me, photo, autograph, photo, autograph. And um, then all of a sudden, what happens in Japan? A sea of security came, parted the waves. And we were escorted out of the building. A bunch of security with umbrellas escorting us into a taxi. And it was just like, you know, it was nuts. Absolutely insane. And you're not even with Paul at that point? No. It was like a picture of the of the band on stage. And I was quite up front. This person must have just looked at me and looked at the picture. And <laughs> yeah. I also read a story about you going to New York. You were going to go out or you wanted to go out and John uh, on your own and John Weller's like, no, not a chance, mate. Is that right? <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I was talking to a few people. We'd hired in a, a percussion player for some reason because Tracy didn't come with us. That's right. And Steve Sedalnik wasn't with us. And some friends of his were backstage and I was talking to a few of them and what have you. And um, yeah, they said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I don't know. I went and found John and said, I'm going out. He went, no, you're effing not. <laughs> you're going back to the effing hotel. Uh, and that was that. Yeah. Not on his watch. You know, since I went back to America in 87 after that, was the truth. Back in them days, you really had to be streetwise. I remember Dennis telling me that if you take long strides and look as mental as they do, so they'll leave you alone. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be all right. <laughs> so you toured with the band until 1985, so just before our favourite shop. This sounds like a magical experience, but I think also I'd love to talk about since then you've toured with, I mean, it seems like hundreds of bands and artists. You mentioned the truth and supported um, the Hooters to Pow. Tell me about Special Beats as well, which is a mixture of the specials and the beats. It sounds yeah. like this, but you do kind of have to explain it. But how did that come about? Well, way back 
well, in, in 84, we did uh, the CND gig at Cov Theatre. General Public were playing, which was Dave and Roger from The Beat and Horace from The Specials. Horace, in his usual sarcastic self, came up to me and I said, I've always wanted to meet you. And he said, oh, I've always wanted to meet you too. And <laughs> <laughs> so we sort of hit it off then. Um, we sort of stayed in, stayed in touch. And he saw me playing in a local band. I think that was about 85 as well. And I was playing guitar. And he didn't realise that I played guitar. So um, that planted the seed in his head. And they did one tour, a club tour, a special beat in America. Horace remembered that I played guitar and he asked me. So, I, uh, yeah, I got the audition through that. That was mad. That was proper mad. Really, really good gigs. We, we toured with Sting for... For a couple of months and we were doing madison square and stuff like that, that i was, was... i was going to say you're back in new york madison square gardens which i don't think weller's ever got to play i know john weller always wanted to yeah. conquer madison <laughs> <laughs> we're sticking thumbs up <laughs> and i've got a grammy as well well we'll get on we'll, we'll get on to the grammy because what's it like supporting a guy like sting and, and how different is sting to weller they're just sort of like institutions aren't they and they do what they do and they're famous with their fans for doing what they do. So I guess in that in that sense, they're similar. You know, the police did the same thing as the jam, you know. They worked the clubs and um, they used to get gigs from the, the Sex Pistols when they cancelled, you know, stuff like that. So in that respect, I mean, Sting was a big fan of the specials and the beat for obvious reasons. They'd actually started doing new material, a special beat. So it dropped on Miles, Miles Copeland's desk and uh, he played it to Sting and Sting really liked it all and invited us on the tour. Funnily enough, the first gig we did, apparently the, his road crew were telling us Sting was at the side of the stage with his band. We were all leaping around like idiots doing Concrete Jungle and all that sort of thing. And and he was pointing at us, going to his band, this is what a band should sound like and look like. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) Not a bunch of old session music. (laughs) But yeah, we used to watch them. (laughs) It's funny that, that when we did the special beat thing in America, the kids were just getting into it for the first time the two-time thing, the scar thing had just taken off on college radio and and all that. So it was their first time round. We were doing club gigs as well and bands like No Doubt were supporting us and stuff. So it was bonkers getting all these American kids just going mental, absolutely mental. Then when we brought it back to the UK, it was a a resurgence and we had the hot sweaty clubs and the steam coming off the the mirrors at the back of the room and all that sort of thing. And it was as crazy as it always was. And then you know, fast forward, I, I did the selector and, and it was crazy again. We used to lose two or three pounds in weight every night. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned the Grammy. Um, so this is, I didn't realise this, Lee Scratch Perry, reggae legend. I discovered his music through Adrian Sherwood. I was really into our new sound when I was younger. As you see, I loved all that stuff, Dub Syndicate. He's back with Rainford a year before last, which is just a brilliant album from the two of them together. Uh, but this was an album I hadn't even stumbled across. This is Jamaican E.T. To say I've never met anybody like him and never will again you know it's just an understatement he was just bonkers i mean the amount of um uh <laughs> substance that he was using, <laughs> there wasn't there wasn't going to be any other outcome really um but he he wanted to be known as the king of soul we were sort of thinking well you know <laughs> how's a reggae legend going to do that and he was playing us like motown and stuff like that and we were just turning the chords around going in playing what we thought up for two minutes or three minutes and then he just warble over it i remember doing some guitar overdubs he said uh, he said oh play me that Jimi hendrix i want to get in touch with john lennon and <laughs> nuts stuff just really nuts <laughs> he used to do his vocals in the control room and Roger, the um, the producer, could hear this rattling because he had his own mic and it had like plasticine and all these like stuff on it. Everything he had had badges and yeah, all sorts of odd things on it. And he could hear this rattling and he said, can I see your mic? And he sort of tentatively gave him his mic and he unscrewed the top. And there was a load of pills in the top <laughs> of the <his> mic. <laughs> 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 yeah, there was loads more stories, but I went, yeah, I went, I went go into too much. But we actually ended up doing a show of the the album and, and and his old stuff, and that was just chaos as well. He came on stage with a with a crown and a Superman out- outfit, like a padded one. He had a throne and a saber sort of thing, you know. And everybody went bananas, but <laughs> we, it sort of like 
we were sort of, you know, getting him through the songs. Bonkers. That sounds, that sounds a bit like I saw Dr. John in the 90s when I think Paul had played on one of the albums and he came over to the UK and played. And that sounds similar in terms of just absolutely bonkers, but brilliant. But you think, I don't know how this is happening. How is it? It was, one of, it was quite surreal. The whole experience was very surreal. Did you know when you were working on it that it was this is a really special album? To go from that experience of winning the Grammy? I always say I think it was the only reggae album that was released that year. <laughs> 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 the default <laughs> it was on a shoeing <laughs> it won before it won so yeah uh, <laughs> who knows yeah <laughs> your guess is as good as mine now back to the style council and you've created from the style council talk to me about this and how you're back on the road doing those songs again i got a band together to do this festival that was supposed to be going ahead but because of a storm it, it didn't and i was just doing it under my own name and i've got together three four five style council songs they sounded really good and um it just expanded from there and then we got jay involved who i hadn't seen since 84 and that was pretty amazing we sort of just fell back into it and it was nice to sort of take a long hard look at everything and we were adrenaline fueled to say the least on those gigs i'm surprised it didn't last five minutes because of the speed and ferocity that we played everything with <laughs> and sort of to listen to the to the recorded versions and the live versions they were chalk and cheese and it was just nice to get the energy but in a sort of a more controlled state if you like yeah um, and to get that vibe back together with the band which i think we have and to have some incredible players around me i mean whitey suggested neil bullock the drummer he came in he's such a massive weller and style council fan he knew all the songs straight away he just knew them. it felt so easy with things like that and the people you put people around you to make to make your life easy you know mm. when you get that sort of quality of player around you you know you you're the only person that's going to mess up so <laughs> It's a bit like you hear about that in football, don't you, though, where you, I'm a Chelsea fan for my for my sins. When the club started bringing in these incredible players, it brought the standards of everybody else up who had been there for <laughs> Frank Lampard um, before he was sacked the other week. Talks yeah. about that as a player when suddenly they were buying all these big players. And, and you're right, you do raise your game for the performers that you're with. And it sounds like you've got an incredible crew with you. Oh, incredible. Indeed, incredible. I mean, just for instance, um, Tony Robinson, the uh, trumpet player, has played with the Mannix and Beautiful South and, and an amazing array of people. Jay's got a, a CV as long as your arm as well, since the, the council and brand new heavies and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, Mike, the keyboard player, was in King. He was in chairman of the board. He was He's done all sorts of stuff with me. And it's really great fun to do, to do all that stuff again and approach it fresh and just sort of have the time to hone in on it, really. What are the songs that stand out? So the ones that you go, actually playing these again, get such an amazing reaction. Pretty much all of them. You realise the quality of the, the songs when you revisit them after such a long time, being down on the scene and ever-changing moods and stuff like that. Just absolutely cracking songs. Just really are amazing songs to play and to listen to and perform and, you know, the crowd know all of them know know every little bit of every nuance of every song you know so it's, it's great fun to do just a real nice opportunity and what's it like to work with jay again then it was like as if time stood still the first rehearsal she she turned up to 35 years later you know she'd re-listened to everything and it just all felt nice and natural and it was just a sort of an obvious thing to do it's it's great to have to have somebody else there that, that went through it all in terms of the records for the style council what experiences and memories have you got paul was playing bass on quite a few things at the time and a lot of the stuff was done before i got in i think um guys from the joe boxers did some stuff with them as well because i was literally staying over the road i was always in the office and the little back area like and i was always annoying people i used to get sort of desk mixes from from Pete without the bass and stuff so I could practice and all that sort of thing. John's office, Kenny's office, Nicky was always on the on the desk out front. Yeah, as I say, it was a, it was quite a big sort of family environment. It was it was pretty cool and relaxed. And uh, because everybody sort of bogged off at night, I was sort of left in the B and B and I used to go over there quite often uh, at night and they'd have different sessions going on. Different and Tilbrook did their album there. Oh, really? Oh, wow. To know that. Yeah, and I, I was in on the sessions on there. I was answering the phone for them and stuff. <laughs> this and is when they took a break from Squeeze. Yeah, me and Steve went to see them, actually. 
uh, when they did they toured as different until Steve White. Yeah, we got tickets. So that that was pretty cool. One thing that always sticks in my mind is um, Marilyn, the singer, was doing a a few tracks with Boy George. And there was a little um, green in front of the studio. And I was just walking over the road from the B&B to the studio. And I had no idea they were in there. And what sort of came into my vision was Boy George and Marilyn having flipping fisticuffs on the <laughs> lawn from the most bizarre <laughs> sight you could ever be confronted with. <laughs> I wonder what about. <laughs> yeah, right. That must have I mean must have been a bit annoying that Paul was so good at bass as well though, to be to be the one then doing the records. That must have been a bit frustrating. Yeah, indeed. And I think because he knew what he wanted, I've heard quite a few people that get other people in they know what they want and realize that they're the people that can do it you know so he did at the time i mean when they got chameleon you know he was a stunning player so the ball was in his court i was learning quickly but i don't think i was learning quickly enough because i didn't have experience in the studio and stuff like that so i do remember um time in rehearsals and i can't remember the song it might be down in the sen it might have been piccadilly trail that's another amazing track. But they sort of, Paul, Mick and Steve stayed behind. I remember them playing me a track and saying, you know, what can you come up with for this? And I think I got about two minutes and then they went, oh, what? okay. I don't want to sound sort of ungrateful, but I don't think I was given as far as that's concerned, of, you know, a good crack of the whip in the studio like Steve was. Because so I think Steve started in the studio. I started in rehearsals, you know, so I was just playing my interpretation of what was down and stuff in as far as doing covers you know i was coming up with with lines for for those you know different alternative lines and stuff this sounds amazing and thank you so much for joining me Anthony. this is an absolute blast what does it feel like to be part of this community then of honorary councillors and these people we lost touch a long time ago but obviously because of social media you sort of get back in touch and we've sort of got together a couple of times and uh, and it's just it's just really nice i mean with musicians most of the time you know you spend your time in a closed environment with them you come back together with them however long apart it is and it's as i said with jay it's as if time stood still so it's always easy to start to carry on where you left off you know you went through you got through it together sort of yeah. in a, that sort of experience i've got two final questions for you as always on the podcast i'll ask you to select one paul weller song it can be the jam the style council or the solo you've got one song for the rest of your life which one would it be oh i think i think probably um down in the scent with or without the French lyrics? Oh, there's a question. I've got a really early demo of it, actually, and he's just muttering words. I love that because it's dead simple. But any any version. That is a brilliant <laughs> song. I, I love to seeing that on Days of Speed where he, um, he played yeah. on the acoustic tour, the solo acoustic tour. I think that's what sort of relit the passion for the song with me, yeah. Love it. The aim of this podcast is to get that meeting with Paul to have the interview that eluded me for so many years as a radio broadcaster. Uh, what one question should I ask him? Oh, God, that's... Talk about putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> has he won a Grammy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How does it feel to not have played at Madison Square? (laughs) (laughs) Are there any topics you think, actually, this is the stuff that Weller likes to talk about or certainly did back then? Well, at the time, it was politics, politics, and we always used to try and change the subject. (laughs) Oh, really? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, not again. Uh, (laughs) He's not not still moaning about Thatcher, is he? Come on, Christ. (laughs) (laughs) And Neil Kinnock, absolutely no idea. Oh, why did you smash that guitar on on the tube in Soundcheck? My favourite guitar. No, tell me the story. What happened here? It was the second tube. Paul had this beautiful Aria. It was a Herb Ellis, big semi-acoustic. It's on lots of photos in in the studio and Cafe Blur time. We were soundchecking for about an hour. must have been an hour plus because they had some technical problem. Paul just completely lost it and just got fed up. Of, we, we played Shout to the Top about, you know, 30 times or something. Oh, man. <laughs> he just grabbed the guitar from around his neck and just chucked it. And I saw it in slow motion, just heading down towards the bit where the people stand. And it just, the neck just went like that. And I actually felt tears coming to my eyes. I was that, because it was such a gorgeous guitar. 
I just thought, what the hell? (laughs) (laughs) I just felt so down about that for a long time. Still do. (laughs) Oh, man, I can see tears in your eyes. Um, That's a lovely question. Thank you, Ash. Ash was startling. Um, This has been an absolute blast, Anthony. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Good luck with From the Style Council and getting back on the road as well. Fingers crossed that will happen very soon. And as soon as it does, we'll share those tour dates and stuff like that, because I think it's amazing for people to come out and see you. And and like you say, those songs still stack up and that live experience experience will be fantastic you're very welcome thanks for having me what an absolute blast that was thank you for your time anthony once again and don't forget to check out from the style council coming soon to a live venue near you i'm sure next up we stick with the bass guitar to hear from kevin miller from groovin to shout to the top kevin was there plus he was part of the soul squad with tracy young signed to paul's record label respond and touring the world supporting the style council Don't forget, if you enjoy what you're listening to, please share this episode on social media. Help to spread the word. Let's get one of your weller loving mates listening today. You can leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help us to find new listeners to the show. Find me on Twitter at WellerFanPod or on Instagram and Facebook, Paul Weller Fan Podcast. See you next time.